My name is Jeff Browdy. I'm the Vice President of Compliance Solutions for Rectangle Health. And I want to thank everyone for joining this morning or this afternoon's webinar on cybersecurity and HIPAA officer certification training. I know everyone is super busy and for you to take out a little bit of time in your day, I feel responsible for that. I feel responsible for providing you not only some CE credits, but hopefully some value that you can take back to the practice. But administratively, I know many of you are here for the CE credits. <laughs> and just, just so you know, administratively, um, we will get those to you via email. If you happen to be a AGD member, uh, part of the Academy of General Dentistry, uh, if you send us, if you send Matthew G at PCIHIPAA.com, your state and license number, we'll enter that for you. You don't have to do anything. Uh, but don't worry, this webinar is not only for the dentists that are on the webinar today, it's for everybody. It's a uh, generic compliance and, and cybersecurity applies to any healthcare provider. So you will get value, you will get credits. Uh, please give us about one to two weeks. There's a lot of people on today's webinar. This is a topic that hopefully is interesting to everybody. I know it's it's very timely, uh, especially considering that everything that's going on. And like I said, you'll, you'll receive uh, one and a half CE credits. You have to stay on for the whole 90 minutes uh, because that kind of keeps us in the right, the right boundaries of what we need to do. We got to make sure people are on. We can't just pass out the credits. They want to make sure they're on and you being logged in tells us that. And then at the end, I'll kind of go through and let you know how you can get uh, a couple of more CE credits if, if you're interested, especially a lot of you HIPAA officers, security officers that might be on today's call, office managers. Uh, you can go online at your own pace and get a couple more credits to go a little deeper into some of the topics that we will be discussing. Uh, just a little bit about myself and PCI HIPAA. Um, I founded the company back in 2012. And we were really focusing on, you know, how do we how do we help practices? HIPAA protects patients. That's it's there to protect your patients' privacy and security. We're going to talk a lot about that. OSHA protects your employees, and we're here to protect you. Uh, we were recently purchased by Rectangle Health, and uh, really, really excited to be part of that group. Rectangle is an amazing company. Uh, they also provide payment solutions to help your practice become more efficient, uh, save money, save time. And we, PCI HIP, have been endorsed by many, many associations. Uh, really proud to be part of that, not only dental associations, but also medical associations. And we work and breathe and live HIPAA every single day. So today's agenda, how am I gonna consume time for 90 minutes? Uh, well, I've had a ton of coffee. I'm raring to go. I have a lot of topics. I have a lot of slides. And the philosophy of the webinar is to provide you a lot of information fairly quickly because you're all in a different space. You're all in a different knowledge base. And hopefully, you know, through these topics, we're going to be able to give you some value and you'll be able to take something back to the practice. So you're better off tomorrow than, you're an than you are today. You don't have to take notes. If you want to take notes, those of you that are note takers, you have a pen in hand and you're scribbling and you're going, you can do that if you feel comfortable. However, Jacob, who's also, uh, I want to thank him for producing the webinar today. All I need to do is show up, but he does everything else. Uh, he's going to send you the presentation. Uh, we will have some, we're required to just engage with you. So we're going to ask you some questions along the way online. And you could you can just type them in. That'll show that you're that you're paying attention. Hopefully, that's my job, not your job, but uh, your job to pay attention. My job to keep your attention. And so please engage with that. And then there's going to be a survey at the end. And you know, I always tell my team that you know constructive criticism is the best thing you can get. So that feedback helps us get better, uh, continue to improve, and we appreciate you doing that at the end. So the agenda. Risk considerations around HIPAA and the headlines. Like I said, we're reading about this every single day. We're going to share with you some of that. We're going to go through a risk assessment. 
Um, and we're going to talk about why you need that. It's a requirement under HIPAA. Many of you do not know that you need a risk assessment. We're going to actually go through the risk assessment so you, so you have that. And then we're going to talk about the most common vulnerabilities. Our team is calling practices and offices every single day. And we talk to you and we kind of learn where your vulnerabilities are. We educate you. And we're going to go through the ones that are the top ones that float that we think the ones that you should be spending the most time on. Ransomware is one of them. Um, we're also, and, I'm, and, and once I get through all that, I'm gonna kind of round it up and give you 20 tips to protect your practice at the end. And like I said, there's some, there's some free offers uh, for additional CE credits that we can walk through. There's, uh, well, I'll, I'll get through when we get to the risk assessment, we'll go into the chat box and links and things that you can do um to, to take the risk assessment but we'll wait a little bit on that if you do have a question there is a chat box uh there's a question box jacob is answering those questions along the way we review them at the end of the webinar i will go through them with him we will get you answers consider us your friend consider us your link to these complex laws that the government comes out with HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It was enacted back in 1996 uh, by President Clinton. And his, his intent and the administration's intent was to reduce costs and simplify your administrative process. Everyone throw up on the computer now. Thank you. Whenever the government gets involved in this kind of stuff, we always know it becomes complex. It becomes burdensome. That's why we're here. That's why we have a company. But the last sentence there, which I should have highlighted, improving the privacy and security of patient information. I think we could all rally around that that is important. You have a lot of information. It's your responsibility to keep it private and secure. HIPAA, part of HIPAA was to improve that and, and make sure that you're putting the safeguards in place. And it's not optional, ladies and gentlemen, it is mandatory. It is enforced by the Department of Health and Human Services, Office for Civil Rights, and we are seeing fines increase more and more every single day because unfortunately the industry is not compliant. And we're gonna, we're gonna walk you through to get a risk score for you to see how compliant you are. But before we do that, Let's talk about the risk considerations that you should consider. So you're either a big risk taker and doing nothing, or you're doing something but you're not sure what to do, or you're doing, maybe you have a practice advisor that comes in every week and you're spending a ton of time and a ton of money and you're trying to figure out how do I simplify this? I don't wanna, I don't wanna continue to burden my staff. There's, there's a whole range of, of risk tolerance. And, and I like to say, just because it's the law doesn't mean that you don't need to take some business acumen into how to approach HIPAA. And, and so just to talk a little bit about that, there's non-compliance risk. Like I said, it's the law. If you're doing nothing, I think you're taking too much risk. That would be my opinion. Based on what I see, based on how things can happen, what can happen. If you're doing nothing and, and you're just you're just ignored it, thank you for being on this webinar. This is a great start. Um, is the HIPAA police gonna show up at your door? No, they just don't. They won't do that. Um, they don't have enough bandwidth. They don't have enough people. Um, but what does happen and what I'm gonna show you is that if you have a data breach, it's self-reporting. You have to report the breach. That's required by law. And if you have a patient complaint, they can go online, they can report you, and they will go and then they will do an audit. And they will determine at what, what safeguards did you have in place at the time of the breach. And if you've had nothing, or if you, you know, weren't sure what the laws were, they call that willful neglect. And if you willfully neglect the law, your risk potential, the, the, your financial and reputational risks go way up. So, you know, you're you're sitting at the card table. Are you only going to play with aces and 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 spend a ton of time and a ton of money on this? 
I don't think you need to. I think there needs to be a balance. But if you're doing nothing and you're playing every single hand and you're just hoping for those cards, um, it's going to catch up with you one day. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And, and I'll show you what's happening and why I feel that way. Um, interestingly enough, I was looking for some new golf clubs to, to improve my game, which is it's never in the clubs. It's always in the it's always in the in the in the head. That's what golf is. But I'm looking through these to, to look for some golf clubs. And in Consumer Reports, it says protect yourself from a medical data breach. Why is Consumer Reports telling your patients, the consumer, to protect yourself from a medical data breach? Um, because your personal information you have and it's stored by hospitals and doctors and healthcare providers insurance companies and it is increasingly a target for hackers why why are hackers targeting healthcare so strongly every day believe it or not why is that well you have a lot of information right you have individually identifiable health information, names, social security numbers, my birth date, my mother's maiden name, my telephone, fax number, everything that someone could use to create a data breach. They can create identity theft with this information. They could open up lo lo lines of credit at our favorite electronic stores. Yes, that has happened to our clients. Somebody stole this information and opened up a line of credit at Best Buy and started buying TVs and, and everything that they wanted. And that's what they do. You, you have this information and it is valuable. And let me, let me just walk you through some of the things I see um, just, to, just, to kind of, just to kind of make you more aware. This is... This is not the scare tactic part of the webinar, although I have gotten feedback through the survey that Jeff is just trying to scare us. Well, um, it is scary. It, it is. I, I admit that. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to educate you on what we see happening so that you can be proactive rather than reactive. If you're, if you're reactive, you are scrambling to keep your practice going and to deal with something that might happen. If you're proactive, you're doing things to help prevent some of the things I'm gonna show you now. So let's just, I Google just so you can see this. So it's just not coming from my mouth. I'm, I'm actually showing you. If, you. if you Google buy stolen medical records and you go on to Google, you will see a ton of articles. Hackers are stealing millions of medical records. Why is, protected health information valuable to hackers. Stolen patient records, a hot commodity on the dark web. Well, the dark web is a web browser that we don't use. It's anonymous. It's kind of like the Bitcoin of web browsers. There's different kinds of websites. They sell illegal things. I'll show you that. But, but hackers will actually go and steal medical records and sell them on the dark web. How much do you think one of your medical records is worth today on the dark web? Da -da 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 -da. The answer is about $250. So think, think, about, think about that for a second. If you have a thousand records, those records are worth 250 grand to a hacker, potentially. If you have 4,000, it's a million bucks. Quick math, I'm a CPA by trade, by the way. I just thrown that out there. Uh, not to brag, but just to know I could do math quickly in my head. So 4,000 records equals a million dollars. Those of you that have that, it's a lot. If you, even if you have a thousand records, it's a lot. And they'll go on the, on the dark web. This is not the dark web. I don't go on the dark web, but I found a website that unfortunately is really like the dark web. Um, and you can see here, that people are shopping for credit card numbers, which you have potentially stored on an Excel file, which you should not do ever. Um, you have there's PayPal accounts, there's Venmo accounts, and yes, there are health records that they buy. There's people buying things right now, and they use stolen credit cards to do it. And unfortunately, what happens is when there is a data breach, and you end up on the dark web, or you have a patient complaint, or something happens. You have to report it 
um, to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is their breach portal. And a lot of my contemporaries say, this is the wall of shame. You never want to be on the wall of shame. And, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't appreciate that term because it's not shameful to get hacked and have to report it. That's not shameful. That is what happens. That because there's value to these hackers. And as you can see, they're going to every type of medical provider. There are dentists, there are eye doctors, there are insurance companies, there, there's business associates that we're gonna talk about. There are a number, there's oncologists, um, there's, I hope none of you are on here, ophthalmology, a, a ton, we had a whole ton of, of um, ophthalmologists and, and eye care providers that got hacked through their software. And it's in every state. Doesn't matter what state you're in, they don't care. Doesn't matter how many records you have. If it's over 500, you have to report this within 60 days and you're up here. And, and you can see the type of breaches. It's hacking, it's IT, unauthorized access means this could be an employee, it could be a, a coworker, it could be somebody. Theft, you know, people stealing records, that's a data breach. And again, they're doing this and, and look at the location. It's email, we're gonna talk about the vulnerabilities of email. It's your network, we're gonna talk about the vulnerabilities of your network. And these and your laptops, uh, we'll talk about laptops. Laptops are are a problem. Um, and we see this every day. And this is what we learn about. This is what this is why I do the webinar. I want to not scare you, but I want to open up your eyes to the things that happen. And unfortunately, um, like I like I mentioned before, there's penalties and the penalties continue to go up every single year. And you know they can charge fifty thousand dollars per violation per each violation, and they're not. You know what we see is they're they're not in the business of putting you out of business, but they're in the business of sending a message that if you are not implementing the safeguards required under HIPAA, we will fine you, and we will. And that is painful if you don't have the protection that you need to protect yourself from fines and data breaches and things like that. So um, we're gonna have uh, some giveaways, $25 Amazon giveaways. Jacob, I didn't, I, I probably didn't tell you, but who, the first person to go into the chat box to put the name of this legendary Dodger broadcaster, who I, in the 60s, God, I'm aging myself, in the late 60s, would go to bed with every night and listen to this broadcaster announce the Dodger games. Again, I'm from Hotel California, and uh, we lost him, unfortunately, last week. And I'm giving, paying a little tribute to my, my man, one of my heroes, and uh, I want to give something away in his honor today. So, Jacob, if, if anyone, the first person that Brandon may Brandon Neighbors, Brandon Neighbors. Brandon Neighbors, congratulations. Uh, our our hero Vin Scully, may you rest in peace. Uh, Brandon Neighbors will win a twenty-five dollar gift certificate in Vinny's honor. So uh, love you, Vinny. I'm glad I can pay tribute to you uh, and and uh, everybody else that's on. Okay, let's move on before I start to cry, which which I actually did at our all hands meeting when I read Vinny's broadcast <laughs> when he. When he his last words on on uh, you know they they put his last words in his last broadcast ever as a Dodger broadcaster and I read it in front of the company to, for his honor and I broke down but I'm not going to break down now but I'm going to I'm going to read you what's required under HIPAA this is my disclaimer you need to read this before I can go on okay go read it yeah this is kind of what the law looks like it's financial and legal gobbly a goop and my job is to simplify this and have you focus on the things that we feel are most valuable now like i said i'm going to have a couple little uh questions this is one of them so there there are there are three types of safeguards so under the hipaa security rule so there's the hipaa security rule and there's the hipaa privacy rule 
And the HIPAA security rule is all about keeping the data that you have secure. And the HIPAA privacy rule is all about keeping that data private. Now, let's start with the security rule. There are three groups of safeguards. These are things that, you, these are activities, actual activities that you need to do as a practice to comply with the security rule. And they fall under these three categories, the administrative safeguards, which are administrative things, documents, policies, things like that, technical safeguards. A lot of you rely on your IT provider to provide this, which they may or may not be doing and may or may not understand. Uh, and then there's physical safeguards, which is just the physical access to hardware, software, things in your building. Um, and these are the three categories, administrative, technical, and physical, that you need to consider implementing within your practice. Now, I mentioned, how many of you have a risk assessment on file in your practice? I'm raising my hand. I don't know why I'm doing that, but I can tell you, because we talk to people all the time, that not many of you have it. And so what I thought we would do as part of a training process, but to get you the risk assessment, you need it. It's not gonna, it's usually, this is a hundreds of dollars to get a risk assessment done. You're on the call, we have an hour and a half. Um, Jacob has put the link, and, and again, this is required. He put the RA link right here in the chat box that you can see. I don't know if you can see it on my computer, but he put it in the chat box. So if you click on that RA link, um, you're gonna go. You're gonna go to a page that looks that looks like this. Uh, I'm gonna pull it up right now on my computer so you can see it. And this is the first page you can go. I want everyone to do that. The importance of this. There's there's a couple things. One, at the end, you're gonna get a risk score. No one's gonna know the score except you. Okay. So you're gonna get that score, and it's gonna kind of tell you between zero and a hundred where you are in the risk, how much risk tolerance you're taking, what you're actually doing. Most practices that we experience when they take this are, you know, below 60, 70, 60, even lower. Some, some people just aren't doing much. That's okay because it's confusing. So one, you're gonna get your risk score. Two, we're gonna send you a PDF report, an actual report that shows that you took the risk assessment because the law says that you have to self-assess yourself on what you're doing and what you're not doing around those safeguards, around the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards. What do you have in place today? What don't you have in place today? We put together the questions that we feel apply to you in an online risk assessment. So if you click on that, you put your first name, last name, you're gonna get the report, you're gonna get a score, you're gonna get some training right here in the next, I would say, maybe 15 minutes, 20, nah, probably 15 minutes, depending on how fast I go or slow I go, but put all that information in, hit continue, and it's really important that you have this. Again, it's free, doesn't cost anything, and then you're gonna get to this first question, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda walk you through the questions to make them a little clear, hopefully. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box, Jacob will answer them, and then together, we will have a risk assessment. And like I said, we're gonna send you a copy of that and you can review that and you can ask questions and do whatever you want, but at least you have it. If you get audited, this is the first document they're gonna ask you for. Do you have a risk assessment? When did you do it? Did you self-assess? Because if you don't have that, you can't show somebody that you are developing a culture of compliance. You, can't, you don't have any documentation to show that you're doing things to protect your practice, okay? So let's start with this. Does your practice create and implement policies and procedures for managing risk. So if you've never taken a risk assessment, you don't have one on file, you would say, I, well, you could say yes to this because now you're gonna do it. So let's just say yes to that. When was the last time you updated HIP, your HIPAA policies and procedures? Now, a lot of you buy these and never update them. Um, you know, within the last 12 months, over 12 months, it's important that you have a set of policies and procedures on file because they are the roadmap. They are, they're actually great documents if done correctly and updated timely to educate your employees. So you're gonna wanna make sure you have those. Um, do you have a formal program that goes through the risk assessment and then starts to implement some of the safeguards? So have you already done this? Have you already put a plan together to do this? Yes or no? Um, there's specific policies that you need, number four. 
You need workstation use policies, acceptable use policies and sanction. These are for your employees. These are to tell your employees what they can do with their workstation, what's acceptable and not acceptable. And HIPAA requires you to sanction employees if they're not following your direction. So you either have these on file and are implementing these or not. And then what about system activity? Do you have policies and procedures with your IT provider written to document what's happening in your network? You may have to ask your IT provider. Again, that's okay. If it's uncertain or you have to ask somebody else, don't worry about it. Click that button. You're the only one getting this, okay? So again, don't worry if, if it's confusing or you're not sure if you've done it. Now, many of you office managers are the security officer at the practice, at the HIPAA officer. So do you have you actually written and implemented a policy that designates you as the security officer and that you fully understand what's required in that role? Many of you just aren't sure or you haven't gone through that administrative requirement. That's required under HIPAA. And then do you maintain records where you can identify each employee's access into any kind of device, any kind of protected health? And remember, remember, that information that you have, that information that's at risk, you have to be able to identify every single employee's access in your practice to that information. Who is it? and how much access do they have? You may have to ask your IT provider. We're gonna talk about business associates. Have you identified all your business associates and have you executed business associate agreements with them? You either have done that or you haven't done that. And, and do you know if there's an indemnification clause? We're gonna talk about that. You may not know, you may have to ask your, your lawyer. Um, screening employees, this is important. New employees that come in, are you running background checks? When, before they before you hire a new employee and when was the last time you did a training like this where you start to understand a little bit more some of the safeguards that are required under HIPAA have you done it you know I know with COVID it's been hard with everybody it may take a little longer uh, maybe you've never done it that's okay and how is it conducted we want to understand that so that we can make some recommendations to you on maybe how to do it better how to do it more efficient um, just to get a little bit more. It's our job. That's what we do. We try to make recommendations. We try to help people if they need it. And so we get a little bit of information there. Does your, Now, incident response. An incident is if you have a fire, a flood, a ransomware attack, do you have actual written policies and procedures to identify what to do during an emergency? Uh, many of you, and we just don't spend the time to do that, but it's, it's starting to become more and more important. Um, and on the same note, have you prioritized the actions that you have to take when there is an event and something like that does happen? Now, when you terminate an employee or a business associate, do you have a process and a policy of what to do so that they don't have access back into the practice, back into the protected health information. You have to terminate them. You have to identify them and terminate them because often when you have a terminated employee or a business associate, it's more risk because there's usually something that may have happened. And, and they, if they have access, that creates more risk. So you actually have to have policies and procedures around that. And then anything regarding HIPAA, anything regarding what you're doing around your security or your privacy, you have to keep those documents for six years. That's pretty easy. Um, your employees and training your employees are critical. They are your first line of defense. And when you train them, you actually need written acknowledgements showing that they went through training like this. It has to be documented. If you get audited and, and they say, yeah, we did the training a, a couple of weeks ago, they have to see that you actually did that. And, and employees are actually required to show an acknowledgement. Um, I showed you that breach portal. So under the HIPAA breach notification rule, do you really understand that you have to make the, you know, do, do you have to report the breach? Do you understand how to report it? Do you understand what your responsibilities are as the HIPAA officer? I know, I know I have so much empathy for you office managers that are on the call. You're, a lot of this falls on your shoulders if this were to happen. Um, but but one of the things is just knowing what you need to do. You may not know that. Um, as you start to think about each employee 
Is there a unique ID or are they sharing an ID to get into your systems? You can ask your IT provider. Many of you probably have logins and passwords, which are okay. You can't have shared passwords. Um, and, then, and then technically, as we get into the technical safeguards, how are you currently backing up your data? This is a big one. We'll talk about this. Offsite, inside your software, or onsite, maybe a network onsite um, service. And then how many consecutive days, meaning do you just back it up and then today's Wednesday and then tomorrow you're just gonna rewrite Wednesdays or do you actually have multiple days of backup sets? You have Wednesday, but you also have Thursday and then you have Friday, you may not be sure. Um, that's one of the safeguards you wanna put in place. Do, do you have, what about if, if, you, if you had to restore your data do you know how to do that and do you have an exact copy of, of what that would do, what that would be and and are, are, has that been documented with your IT provider um have you ever tested for an have you ever gone through an emergency test that's now required and to be documented um because HIPAA wants to know that if something were to happen you're actually being proactive and not reactive that's basically what that means uh, does your practice have audit controls that you can manage the information system activity? Is your IT provider really monitoring what's happening within your system? Because they could see maybe a potential hacker or an employee that's doing something they shouldn't be doing. Um, what about passwords? How's your password hygiene? Is it good? Is it bad? Do, are you not doing it? Are you doing it? And what about encryption? Are you using encryption for email and backing up data or, or doing that? Do, do you know what encryption is? Um, what about for scanning email? Do you have, email is a big vulnerability. Are, are you protecting the email integrity of your network of, of email coming into your system or outside of your system? And, and what about firewalls and backups? Is that being provided by your IT provider? How long are they doing that? Um, we do not use mobile devices, yes or no. It's, 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 it's written the other way just because of the score, but mobile devices are more, um, are more um, vulnerable, are, are, are more risky when you're using it. So we do not use that. You, if you don't use mobile devices, you hit true. A lot of you do, you'd hit false. Um, and have you taken an inventory of where all your protected health information is within all those electronic devices. Do you know where it all resides? Because sometimes it starts going on iPads and then it's on phones and then it's on this person's server and that person's server. And you're not, you don't have that control of who may have access to your protected health information. Um, and then what about policies and procedures to gain access to your facility? Um, and the PHI for all of that, you know, if there ever is a disaster, what would you do? Again, being proactive, do you have those written down somewhere? Um, and, and what about remote access? In COVID, we had to remote access in, maybe using a VPN. Do you have specific policies and procedures or what employees are allowed to do or not allowed to do in that case? Um, and then when you're disposing of a phone, an iPad, a computer, do you have do you have the right policy in place on, under on how to dispose of that so it does so that information does not get into the wrong hands? Almost done. We're almost done. Um, let's now credit card information is really important. How do you how do you collect that today? Are you using a terminal, maybe through your practice management software? Um, have you taken your self-assessment questionnaire? That's required for payment card industry compliance. Do you have one on, do, have you taken that? And, and have you performed a scan of your IP address to see, because if your credit card terminal is plugged into the internet, you actually have to scan that, that IP address. Um, do you, raise your hand if you have a copy of your PCI certificate. Many of you feel like this is uh, governed or, or taken care of by your credit card provider. You actually need a copy of that uh, on file. Um, we, we actually do, uh, especially now with our relationship with Rectangle, we do, we do a full merchant account security assessment for you. And we will, we will look at your merchant account to make sure that you are PCI compliant and that you don't have vulnerabilities and to show you some of the things that your merchant processor, your current merchant processor is not providing. If, you want, if you're interested in that, 
um, just put yes, we can do that for you. What about what about insurance? Do you have cyber insurance? Yes or no? And about and just to uh, to understand the level of risk. Remember, the more patients, the more risk. A thousand to, to you know, a thousand is two hundred fifty grand. Five thousand could be more, obviously. How many more locations typically is more risk? And then more time in business is typically more risk. So we just want to understand the risk tolerance. Once you once you get to that last question, hit submit. It's going to take a little bit of time because we have a bunch of people on the call today. Um, but what will happen is this will generate a risk score when it, when it gets through everybody's risk assessment. It's going to create a customized PDF for you. It's going to actually show you the um, the questions that you took, the, your answers, and it'll go through a risk score and actually um, ha you'll have something for your files. And, and hopefully even doing this today, it'll be valuable and it, you'll be in a better position tomorrow than you are today. So again, thank you for, for going through that. Again, it'll take a little bit of time because of, you know, we have so many people on the webinar today and, and thanks for attending that. Um, and, and then you'll, again, you'll get your score, you'll get your PDF, we'll send that to you. Um, and great, hopefully that was not too painful. Um, it is a requirement, don't blame me. This is, this is required by the Health and Human Services. Uh, that's a little picture of what you're gonna get. It's, there's more to it than that, but you'll, you'll get a good idea of, of where you are in the process. Okay, so let's, let's continue. Um, remember I said I had those polling questions. So I am gonna pull, I'm gonna pull out the first one, um, which talks about the safeguards that we just went through. And it, it'll ask, and it's gonna come up in just a second. And please answer that. Which of these are not one of the three key HIPAA safeguards? Um, it, it just hold on for one sec. There we go, quick poll to see if you're still with me. This, this tells me, I'm so curious um, if people are actually paying attention <laughs> and, and I'm with you, if you're not on, you could be on Facebook, Twitter, working. I'm I'm in one ear and out the other. Maybe not. Maybe I'm in both ears. Let's see. Yeah, we're doing okay. We're doing okay, Jacob. Um, which of these are not one of the three key HIPAA safeguards? Physical, office, technical, or administrative? Remember those categories we just went through? Um, dun, 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 dun. Okay, most of you are getting it right. Some about 60% have voted. Come on, people, just get me to a certain percentage so I can say we are all here together. We are allowed to provide you CE credits. We are learning. Everyone, we are all here together. Okay, the answer is office. That's not one of them. It sounds like it should be, but it's not. It's physical, technical, and administrative. All right, I'm going to close the poll now. And we shall move on. How are we doing so far? Good? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Hi? Bye? Thank you. Okay, common vulnerabilities. These are the vulnerabilities that I want you to think a little more deeply on. Maybe consider some things you want to do for your practice because we see uh, vulnerabilities in these areas. And I'm going to start with PCI compliance, part of our name, PCI HIPAA. Um, the, the, the history behind PCI HIPAA and the PCI part is that, you know, I, I've come from the credit card processing industry. I worked in it for, you know, 20 plus years. And one of the reasons I started PCI HIPAA was because practices like yours, um, felt like the credit card processor was taking care of their PCI compliance. And what really happened was P the PCI compliance requirements that are governed by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover um, require you to do certain things around PCI compliance. And the practice felt like the credit card processor was taking care of that. And when, when in fact, the credit card processor charges for PCI compliance, they usually outsource it send you an email, 
hope that you don't do it because then they're going to charge you a non-compliance fee, which is all profit. And that's what they do. And that's what I saw many practices um, getting exposed to and many processors taking advantage of the practices. So we started with PCI compliance and then we got into HIPAA because practices were talking about how do you, can you help us with HIPAA? We brought the two together, but the PCI piece is important because you need a PCI certificate on file, like we mentioned in the risk assessment. And the thing is, a PCI violation is also a HIPAA violation because you have payment information. And, and if you're storing that information on a Excel file or you're writing it down or it's not encrypted within your software and it gets hacked, you, you're in a lot of exposure. So what you want to do technically is you need to get your IP address scanned by a qualified scanning vendor because it, most credit card terminals, even if you have a terminal, it's, it's connected into the internet and it's not connected just in a dial up anymore because the internet speed is a lot faster. However, if that IP address is vulnerable, they get in there. They can get in and actually take credit card numbers and then that's a, that's a violation. Um, so you want to make sure that you you take your self-assessment questionnaire every year and you want to make sure that you scan your IP address. And you can do that through a PCI compliance company. We do that at Rectangle. But if, if you want, you know, if, if you're just with a processor, you want to make sure that they're doing that and you want to make sure you have that on file because if you're not doing it, they're going to charge you for non-compliance fees. And we've seen non-compliance fee 30 bucks a month, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, like even higher. So pull out your credit card bill, look for a non-compliance fee. Maybe I'll save you hundreds of dollars a year just by attending this, just by doing that and get your certificate and make sure your credit card processor takes out those fees. And, and you know, you can even you can even negotiate with them and say, look, I didn't even I thought you were doing this for me. I have my certificate. I want all these fees for the last 12 months or so. I want them waived um, because non-compliance fees are just, it doesn't cost the processor anything. The, yeah, they have to be PCI compliant. That's part of being a processor. But the non-compliance fees are just complete profit. And uh, quite frankly, you shouldn't have to pay them. Now, EMV it stands for Euro MasterCard Visa. And that's really dipping the chip, like your your credit card terminal or your your practice management software, however you're using it, you, we all have that chip on our call, on our credit cards now for additional security. You have to make sure that you're using that and, and you're not swiping the card. No more swiping. That was a long time ago. Swiping is, is, uh, is prehistoric. Um, the biggest reason that practices don't understand why that's important is because if you have a patient that has a procedure and they pay by credit card and they're in your practice and they and you collect that payment if they have a chip on their card and you swipe it instead of dipping the chip you are exposed to um chargebacks you will lose the chargeback they the the, the patient can say i know this doesn't sound fair but the patients can say i wasn't happy with the procedure i didn't like what happened I didn't have this procedure. Whatever that is, they can say whatever they want. The first thing the credit card um, companies do is they will look, they arbitrate to see where well, they get the information, they see what happens, they see they they want to see proof of performance by you that you actually perform the procedure. But if if that card was swiped, you will lose it automatically. So you want to make sure that you're using the EMV um scanning process uh, i'm sorry um, the emv insert into the into the computer we're calling dipping the chip um the scanning process like i was getting into is a vulnerability scan of your ip address and talk to your your ip your it provider can't do it because they're not a qualified scanning vendor you have to outsource this to a company that does it and it will tell you if you have outdated windows it'll tell you if your ip address is vulnerable It'll tell you of software vulnerabilities, but if you do that scan and you get the SAQ, thumbs up, you get a certificate, thumbs up, eliminate those fees, and thumbs up, you're in a you're in a better and a safer 
position. And just to show you, again, more news that we see, this was an FBI raid of one of the credit card terminal providers, Pax Technology, because they actually got hacked. They, they had a hacker inside their operating system and the FBI found out through various complaints and they went into PAX and said, hey, you're exposed. And so guess what? All those, all those locations that had that, that, that technology got exposed. So this stuff does happen. And so you wanna make sure you're taking those precautions by scanning that IP address and making sure that you have a clean scan. If you don't have a clean scan, then you need to fix what's going on and then you need to get your certificate. Um, I think we may need to update our disaster recovery plan. This one suggests we all ran around in circles shouting, what do we do, what do we do? This is the mindset of your practice when it, in regards to a disaster. We know that. No one prepares for a ex disaster. No one prepared for having to, I mean, e even our company, we had to leave for COVID. There was, a, we, we have a call center in Las Vegas that talks to practices all day long. On, on a moment's notice, we had to leave and we weren't as prepared. We started to become prepared, but we weren't as prepared as maybe we should have been. Um, that's because we typically, our mindsets are, we don't like to think about bad things. We don't like to think about fires and floods and things like that, but under the HIPAA laws, they actually want you to do contingency planning because they're concerned with if there is an incident, fire, flood, COVID, you know, ransomware attack, what precautions have you taken to protect the protected health information? And then taking that a step further, what precautions have you taken to protect the practice from going under? That's the most important thing. And they actually now require three written documents. If you get audited and you don't have this in place, guess what? It's a, one of those $50,000 violations. You need a data backup plan, a disaster recovery plan, and an emergency mode operations plan. Um, and and we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit about those right now. Data, the first two, data backup and restoration plans. I have a lot of slides. I've already been talking for almost an hour, believe it or not. Yeah, it's going by so fast, Jeff. You're, you're so, you're so uh, funny and witty and educating me. Man, time is flying with you. That's not what I mean. But I, I'm, I'm, I've talked a long time, but my, my point, my real point is, this is a really important slide because if you nail data backup and restoration, if you sit down with your IT provider, first of all, you as the office manager, you as the doctor, you need to understand what's going on with your data. That, that protected health information that's worth 250 bucks a record may be one of your most valuable assets. And it probably is one of your biggest risks in your practice. Access to that is risky. And you need to be proactive and put in your mind that you're gonna have a data breach and how would I keep going? How would I protect that information? What if I had a ransomware attack? How would I restore that information? So data backup and restoration is critical. And I would meet with your IT provider and fully understand and ask them, if I had a ransomware attack, what would we do? How would you restore my data? How are we backing it up? Do we have one set? You need multiple sets. So meaning you should, we are our data backup process with, with our clients. We have over, we have over 30 days of data backup. So if you go on, the, if you get hacked on the first, we have the 31st from the, from the month before. If you get hacked on the 15th, we have the 14th. So we don't, they weren't, they're not going to lose a lot of data. Um, there's other ways to have it just in the cloud and it's constantly being backed up. There's a lot of different types of data backup and you want to make sure one that it's encrypted and two that you have multiple days and three that you really know how to restore it. Because let's say, for example, something happens and you can't get access to your network or you can't or you have a ransomware attack and it's it's locked you out. How do you get your data? 
how do you keep going? If you let's say you can't get into the practice, you can't get in. You know, could, if you had to buy a laptop at Best Buy, if you had to buy, if you had to do something, whatever you I don't care where you buy it, but if you had to restore it, how do you restore it? How do you keep going? And and this is where believe it or not, it sounds simple, but people don't think about it and people don't take responsibility for it. And this is where the exposure comes. This is where practices can go under. So having a very clear data backup and restoration plan where it's documented, you understand it, you've rehearsed it, will protect you. I know this is not what you want to focus on. I know you hire an IT provider to do this, but not all IT providers are alike. We, we partner with many uh, IT providers. A lot of them don't even understand the HIPAA rules. Some of them are really, really good. But you need to understand where yours falls and make sure that they're helping you. I can't stress this enough. Email is also a big vulnerability. Um, there's, there's, you know, where, ransomware comes through email, downloads, phishing, um, many, how many of you are on Gmail, Yahoo, and AOL or some type of free service? Again, I raised my hand, I don't know why, but I know many of you are. My recommendation is to get yourself your own email server. Um, you shouldn't be using a Gmail address anyway. I don't think it's professional from for a, a practice. You need to use your own email server. And with that, you need the right type of software that will protect email coming in and out that's, that's being updated daily. This is a huge vulnerability, and you want to make sure that, one, you have your own server, two, that you have scanning software that's going to identify bad emails and, and put them in, you know, bucket them. That's what we do. We bucket them now, and you can go to the bucket and see what's in there and start to adjust that to stuff that you want, but you need that. And you also need encryption. Many of you send protected health information just over a Gmail account or a Yahoo account or a, you need to, you need, that needs to be encrypted. You can't do, you're, you are exposing yourself so much by just sending out patient information over regular email. Um, the HIPAA privacy rule, the, I, I do a whole webinar on this and, uh, but I want to touch a little bit on it, on some of the things that we see. According to your HIPAA release form, I can't share anything with you. Um, <laughs> This is a doctor talking to one of his patients. You know, ironically, the number one fine right now through through HIPAA is you not releasing your protected health information to the patient in a timely manner. This starts the investigation. Patients complain about this all the time. I don't have any idea why. We haven't really dug into why are practices taking so long to give patients their information? Um, you you can tell me, but typically you have about, I think, five to seven business days to give patients information they need. Maybe they're leaving and they're going to another, another provider and, and you don't want to do it, but we're seeing fines all the time. You can Google this one also, and if you Google HIPAA fines, you're going to see that you need to you need to provide them. It's their information. Uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but the general rule is that it's the patient's information, and in order for you to disclose it, it needs to be in writing and it needs to be approved by them. And you know, it, some of the you know you may get a call from a life insurance provider, an employer, or a school, and it all sounds okay. It all sounds like you can provide it to somebody. Um, you may you may be you may be providing services for an adult child, and just because the child's 18, they're an adult, and and you and and when they're an adult, you can't share that information with the parent, even if they ask for it. And some of that, it's, depending on what you do, some of that is very very sensitive, and and there's a lot of different rules around this, but the general rule is. And keep in mind, it's their information. It's they. You have to give it to them. If if they're gonna allow, if, if you're gonna share it, get it in writing so that you can prove that um that that they've given you authorization. And you know, I, I would say where you don't need to get their authorization, you you don't need it when you're treating a patient. 
So when you're sharing that information to treat the patient with another doctor around their healthcare, you don't need to get an authorization because both doctors are covered under HIPAA and you don't need it to get paid. So you don't need the authorization of information about the procedure to get paid. You need to do everything you can to get paid. But there starts to become you know, other types of things that happen where it gets a little tricky. And, and if it doesn't fall into those two main categories, you have to make sure you're, it's always a good idea to get the authorization from the, from the patient when you're, when you're really not sure. Um, all right, let's, well, the, the other thing, the, the, you know, before I go on, the other thing that I wanna talk about with privacy is, and this is just to give you a little bit more information as a healthcare provider, the HIPAA rules govern the patient and the provider. The, the provider's a covered entity and the patient's the, 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 the patient. And that's where HIPAA is, is, is that's where all the laws are, are covered. So we read a lot about, a, a lot about, it's a HIPAA violation. You know, for example, we, we get questions or we see articles around Tom Brady had something happen and he's injured and he you know broke his hand and it got exposed to the media and that's a HIPAA violation. Well, that's only a HIPAA violation if the doctor exposes that information to the media. If Tom Brady exposes it or if his wife exposes it, that's not a HIPAA violation because it's governed between you, the healthcare provider, and the patient. And we're starting to see a lot of articles on Roe versus Wave. And I'm not getting into that, believe me. I'm not, I'm not diving into that. But again, if if, for example, if someone were to go seek an abortion in a state that doesn't allow it, for example, the provider can't communicate that the patient did that or tried to do that against the law because that's protected health information. That's a protected procedure. That's a protected inquiry between the provider and the patient. That falls under HIPAA. That You can't expose that. But if it comes outside of that patient and doctor umbrella, then it's not a HIPAA violation. Again, if it's media and, and if it's if it's athlete and it just people just get a little confused. I hope I didn't confuse you more, but I wanted to clarify because we're getting a lot of questions and there's a lot of news around that. Patient, covered entity provider, that's where HIPAA falls. Now, it also falls with your business associates. So if you have a business associate, you need a business associate agreement in writing because they need to also protect that patient information. And so who is a business associate? It's anyone that, it's a person or an entity, just mean it could be an individual, it could be a company, but you're providing your patient's information to them for them to do their job on your behalf. That's it. So you're disclosing information to them. They need to do the job. You have some kind of an agreement with them, but guess what? They fall under HIPAA because they need to also protect that information. Now it's in their hands to do their job. They need to put the same safeguards in place that you're putting, those same ones that were on that risk assessment, your business associate needs to do that. The, uh, the, the additional requirement is that you need a, an agreement, a written agreement. HIPAA is requiring you to actually solidify that relationship through an agreement where you're, they're agreeing to protect that information. A little bit of a cheat sheet, you will get this. Don't you have to take notes. But if you think about who you're contracting with, you may be providing it to in your practice management software. They have exposure to all your patient information. It could be a CPA firm that's collecting on your behalf. If they're just doing your taxes and you're not providing patient information, you don't need a business associate agreement with them. An IT provider, they get exposure. A cloud service provider, these are all email. If they, if, you, if they have that access to that information that could potentially put you at risk, you need a business associate agreement. That agreement is going to protect you. Not only is it the law, 
if it's written correctly, it's going to protect you. Now, you, you want to maybe pay attention on a couple of these because we got a little question coming up. But there's always exceptions to the rule, okay? So you don't need an agreement with another doctor, another covered entity. They're covered. You don't need it with a lab, your labs, that's an exception. You don't need it with Medicare, Medicaid, or government, or to collect payment. You don't need, just like for authorization and privacy, you don't need to get that agreement. You don't need the authorization. And you don't need it for janitors, electricians, and landlords. We get a lot of questions around these. Now, why? Why wouldn't you need an, a business associate agreement with a landlord? Well, you know, they're, or, or a janitor would be a good one. They're in the practice, they're cleaning. And the reason why you don't need one is because they're not required to have your patient information. The landlord's not required to have your patient information. You need to protect that. You need to protect it and make sure it's locked up, that they can't get into your network. But you don't have to have an agreement with them because they're not, they may, they may have the ability to incidentally see something, but you need to protect it. And then you don't need it with the post office or FedEx, and you don't need it with employees. It's your requirement to train employees, but you don't need a business associate agreement with them. And we talked about that indemnity, indemnity clause in the, in the risk assessment. All that really means is that in this agreement with your business associate, that there's an indem, a legal indemnification clause. And all that means is if the business associate creates liability for you, they're going to pay you back. They're going to indemnify you. That's what indemnity means. They're going to indemnify you and protect the doctor, protect the practice. You want to have the right business associate agreement in place that protects you. Okay, so polling question number two. Um, just to, hopefully we're all still together here. Uh, thank you. Which of these is not considered a business associate? You're going to want to read all of them. Your landlord, your IT provider, your software provider, or all of the above. Uh, which one is not considered a business associate? Still taking a little bit of time. There we go. Quick poll number two. How are we doing? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is my, this is your communication with me. I appreciate you. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you engaging in this. Obviously, I'm super passionate about it, and uh, I hope that um, I hope that I'm, I'm relaying this in a way where you're going to be able to take something back. So, yes, the right answer is your landlord. That's not one that we just talked about. You got to protect it from your landlord, your your janitors, but they're not business associates. Okay, um, let's continue on our journey. So, next topic is going to be ransomware so this is a big one and it, we see this all the time all the time and i'm sure you already are aware of this but i'm going to go over it uh, pretty quickly but it's it's software that encrypts your files malicious software it locks your screen and then they ask for a ransom now the ransoms typically, you know, I would say historically were for you to just get back into your system. They lock you out and they say, pay us to get back in your system. And, and they you have to pay them through Bitcoin because Bitcoin's anonymous. Probably one of the number one uses of Bitcoin is through paying a ransom. And they create a sense of urgency. But now not only are they just encrypting, you know, from they're, they're stopping you from getting in and you need a decryption key to get in. Um, they're also taking information and selling it. And then that becomes a data breach. So you wanna, if this ever happens to you, there's a lot that you need to do on a forensic side to determine what actually happened to your system. This is what it looks like. This is one type of screen. You would come into the office, you'd fire up that computer and boom, there you go. Your computer has been encrypted. Yeah, military grade and you have this amount of time and they're creating the sense of urgency and they want you to pay what do i do um not uh not a fun day if something like this happens and um a lot of it is done through phishing so email exposure email vulnerabilities they fish you they fish your employees 
and they it really looks like a um, a real email. They're getting really, really sophisticated. There's this cool quiz, uh, phishing quiz with Google.com. You kind of go through the emails and go, hey, is this a real email or is this a phishing email? Does this look legit? Does this not look legit? This is one from Costco. Um, my wife loves to shop at Costco. I don't. And if you look at the word don't right there, right there in the second paragraph, they forgot the apostrophe. Uh, that doesn't look like, would Costco forget the apostrophe in an email to their clients? Probably not. That's a, that's a sign. Um, also at the very top, that's a big sign. Where is this email coming from? Costco shipping agent. If you click on that, you will see it's manager at cbcbuilding.com. That does not feel like Costco. So this is a phishing email and you click on your order or this form and then it starts the malware, gets into your system, locks your system up and you have ransomware. This is from PayPal. Your account has been suspended. An error is detected. What's going on? Update my information, click. Your employee clicks on it. They update their information. They start to see what's going on. They get into your system. Again, if you click on that customer service at the top, that does not look like a PayPal email address. There's probably misspellings in here somewhere. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them all, but this is the kind of stuff we see that you should be looking for, that you should be educating your employees on. This is also very dangerous like ransomware. This is the Kentucky Fried Chicken and Donut Sandwich. I'm, it looks appetizing. It looks like you should eat it. But I'm telling you, more than one a day and you're in big trouble. Um, okay, last polling quiz is the following on ransomware. I promise this is the last one. We have to do these. Uh, I appreciate you participating and we will go through this that which is true of ransomware read all the options um again taking a look there we go quick poll number three last one which is true about ransomware uh thank you for voting thank you for paying attention uh yeah it's it's all of them Bitcoin phishing, it's it's a lot of the a lot of the companies that were on the wall of shame were not wall of shame. I can't believe I just said that uh, <laughs> on the breach portal, not the wall of shame. I, it's not shameful. The, a lot of ones that were on the breach portal, they had ransomware and they were hit by ransomware and they had access to their computers, access to the protected health information, and they had to self-report. And this is what happens, unfortunately. So we want to we want to put those. You know, one way to really protect yourself is going back to that data breach, uh, data backup, and and data restoration slide, and really knowing that if I ever got hacked, if I could restore my data, if I could work with my IT provider and restore it uh, from from a, a day that wasn't hit with ransomware, and I can keep going, I don't pay the ransom. Now you have to see if there was an actual data breach, and if they if they're actually having access to it versus versus just encrypting it, that's why you need a forensic provider. Um, so now, if you think about it, my IT firm handles all my HIPAA compliance, my practice management software makes me HIPAA compliant, my general liability policy and insurance will protect me, my office manager is on top of it for me, all of it. We hear this all the time. I will go back to the empathy of every single office manager you can't handle this all by yourself. Doctors, you can't throw this on the office manager all by herself. This is, it's like having your office manager do your tax return. There's too much involved. It, this, takes, this takes a little bit more consideration in, in these days. Maybe when it was enacted in 1996, it was a little easier, but with all of what's going on, technically to make you more efficient there's a lot more exposure and and if you ever did get breached we talked about the hipaa breach notification rule there's a lot of requirements there's a lot of people that you need to bring together to protect the practice 
you have to do a forensic investigation to see if the data has just been encrypted or has it been accessed. And then if it has been accessed, we've all received those notices from a retailer saying our credit card number has been exposed. You have to do the same thing. Your protected health information has been exposed. You have to segment your patients based on their age and, and what happened. You have to send them a notice. You have to provide them with some comfort that you're doing identity protection for them. You may have to set up uh, a call center to take questions. You have to post it publicly. You have to actually do a press release to say, everyone that was on the breach notification portal, they have to do a press release notifying their patients. That's where the reputational risk comes in play. But you have to do all this and understand what to do. And often you need help doing it. And it's very costly. Um, this was this this happens. This this has happened more than once. But Dr. Uh, Sharma, who's been a client of ours for years, she was in the middle of selling her practice and she had a ransomware attack. And guess what? Her her IT provider did, couldn't restore the data. It wasn't ba being backed up properly, and they hadn't checked it. And so they brought in. Um, they were part of our program. And part of our program is incident response and making sure that we protect you. And, and we negotiated with a professional, to, they ransom, because that was the only way for them to get their data back. And we had to determine whether to do that or not. And then we had to do a full, before we did that, we did a full forensic investigation on making sure that if we paid a little bit of the ransom, that we would get some of the, the data was coming back. It was, it was her data. It was valid data. And then we negotiated more. They, the number started a lot higher than this. Um, and then, you know, we had to do forensic. We had to do legal. We had to do uh, all kinds of different things. It, it costs about $200,000 all in. And, and your, your financial backstop for something like that happening is a cyber insurance policy. And the, it's, not, it's not just the amount. I mean, for, for a... For a typical practice, you know, that $200,000 is, is covered a lot. Um, it's really what is it covering and what are they excluding? Insurance companies are in the business of not paying. They want to exclude everything. And, and we're in the business of representing our clients so they do get paid. And a good policy will cover you for, uh, and again, this is under the, the mindset of not if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen, it, you you could you can put in all the safeguards you want, but they're good. And if they get into your data or something gets stolen or an employee, you know, does something wrong and and you thought they were good employees, you know, you you need to be protected for all of this. If you get fined by HIPAA or PCI, if you have if you have to pay a ransom, you want to be covered for that amount. If you lose if you if you have to send out patient notifications like we've all received and hire a lawyer to do that, you you want to be covered for all those costs. You want to make sure your practice continues to operate when there's a data breach that happens. And and again, a a cyber insurance policy is going to help you do that. Um, because of COVID, there are you want to make sure COVID for OSHA, OSHA has a lot more auditors come in because it's been around a lot longer. And OSHA is protecting your workers. And you want to make sure, and your employees, also your patients for the most part, they can complain too. Um, but you want to make sure that you have written, documented respiratory protection plan in place. I mean, that's that's what COVID is really requiring that that you have that respiratory protection plan and it's written and that and if something were to happen, you can document that you're that you've put it in place and you have it and you've reviewed it with your with your employees and you're doing what you need to do. Um, and then as as a as a regular practice, you still need bloodborne pathogens and documentation, electrical safety, a hazard communication. Um, you need you need a database that shows all of your hazardous chemicals you're using, and unfortunately, with COVID, there's a lot more complaints. And when that complaint happens, they're not only going to ask you about your respiratory protection, but they're going to ask you that you also 
have done the basics. And again, you want that documentation in place. Another Amazon gift card, my Greece queen. Uh, we grew up with Greece and she passed away this week, I think, a couple days, maybe yesterday. Um, Jacob, do we have a winner? Oh yeah, we're buzzing here. Jeff Newland. Jeff Newland, a Greece fan of Olivia Newton-John. May you rest in peace. Um, I like to give tribute to my heroes. So she was one of them. That was a great movie. Do you like that movie, Jacob, or are you too young? I've seen it. Not in the theaters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> streaming um boy i probably saw that in the theaters a lot i don't want to admit how many times okay so uh we have 15 minutes and i'll get you out of here uh i want to review 20 tips to protect your practice this is the lightning round to kind of review my goal is to not overwhelm you my goal is to educate and that you pick a couple of these that you, you take back and you start on that journey. If you're not doing anything, you got to start on the journey. Um, update your policies and procedures and, and make sure you have them updated. Again, your employees are your first line of defense and policies and procedures show that you have a roadmap and, and that you can give them that information they need to help you. That's important. Um, the emergency response, you're going to want to document that PHI, how, how is it being accessed and secured during an emergency? Is it protected if something were to happen? Execute those business associate agreements, right? If you have that indemnification clause, that's gonna help you and the agreements are required. Um, and, and you need to document your progress. If you ever get audited, if you ever have a breach and they audit you, you're gonna wanna make sure that you can show documentation that you are implementing a culture of compliance for your practice. Don't share patient information without authorization. We talked about that as the privacy rule, but if your patients want the information, get it to them timely. It's the number one fine today. Um, train your employees on the dangers of downloads. Downloading anything from the internet is a potential danger. We didn't talk about this, but we had a client who wired money over an email request and they never got it back. And the hacker got into their email and recognized when the doctor was boarding a plane through their calendar, emailed the CFO and said, I'm getting on a plane, I need to wire this money. And it made a lot of sense to the CFO. Never, ever, ever wire money over email. Make sure it's verbal, and make sure you have a password, a verbal password. That will protect you. Um, obviously, limits are important too. But email is, is, uh, is again, it's very vulnerable. Be careful with new employees, get their background. I like, to, I like to trust everybody, but you get one bad seed. You have so much information, it's so valuable. If it gets into the wrong hands, even technically, this is, it, it, it's it's like it's not just the the tech issues that happen it's the simple it's the it's the theft that can happen and and if they get access they can cause havoc um data breach especially we talked to you know we didn't really talk about this but don't share patient photos or information on your website or so, social media is just a nightmare um i know that sometimes people post on social media about a bad experience and you cannot retaliate if you retaliate on social media, that's a data breach. You need to, you, it's, a, it's a HIPAA violation. It's a privacy violation. And you need to take that offline immediately. And just because a patient has a happy experience doesn't mean they allow you to put something on social media. You want to get their authorization. It's their information, just like we talked about in the privacy rule. Uh, password hygiene is important. Make a bigger deal. Everyone knows that the keyboard and 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 practice it you know your last name and all those things they know the hackers know uh, make a much bigger deal about passwords um, use a password to lock your mobile device if you're using a mobile device you can erase all of that through the settings in on apple or samsung google make sure 
make sure it's locked and so you can wipe out any information that may get into the wrong hands. These are easy things you can do that we see where there's vulnerabilities. Um, get, meet with your IT provider, talk to them about your operating system vulnerabilities, by the way, that, that IP address that might be exposed or an operating system that's out of date. Microsoft outdated operating system is one of the main sources of spreading ransomware. So make sure it's updated automatically. I know the thing pops up and, you know, but you can do it at night and make sure you have the proper firewalls and antivirus software in place. Uh, wow, I talked about this too much already, but probably can't enforce it enough uh, that reinforce it enough that backing up your data offsite using 256-bit encryption, having multiple sets of backup will save your practice. Um, Plan for an emergency and expect an emergency. Do one thing.com. I'm not associated with this website, but I think it's pretty cool to just kind of help you along. You do one thing, you know, you make a little progress, make a little progress the next month, and then before you know it, you're in much better shape. Uh, all it takes is a little bit. Public Wi Fi is really, really vulnerable. If you're sitting in a hotel, if you're sitting in a Starbucks, really don't go into your network and don't go on your bank accounts and things like that. It's uh, very vulnerable. We read about it all the time. And laptops are vulnerable too. So if you have a laptop, make sure it's encrypted, make sure it doesn't sit in your car, make sure employees know that if you get access to laptops, we had a, we had a client who purchased a practice, the practice had all their information on a laptop to make it easy for the purchase, and then the laptop got stolen. And things like that happen all the time. Stop using the free email. They're free for a reason. Uh, they they use the information to advertise. They may or may not have great encryption, um, and they um, you know they may not be using as much of the types of software that's out there to protect the email that's coming in and out. Usually, a lot more spam and potentially phishing. So get yourself an exchange server to protect yourself. Get cyber insurance. Uh, it's important. That is your backstop. And make sure that your coverages are, they're not excluding you and not paying you on things that you should be paid for on a good policy. Uh, get your PCI certification, pull out your statement, send it to us, call us. We will review your security and your PCI, really important. Um, conduct a HIPAA risk assessment if you didn't get a chance to, and we will review it with you. We'll get it for you. It's the number one document that is going to get audited. The first one to see if you've done a self-assessment. It's required. You have to do it. Um, and just, you know, we, like I said, I, we're really passionate about this. Um, this we we the vulnerabilities that we see all the time we put together in a software called office safe so we have policies and procedures that are updated daily um we have trainings all the time for your employees more ce credits you can execute your business associate agreements that we talked about all your policies and procedures you'll have we even have you know on the payment side especially with our acquisition by rectangle we have pci compliance for you and we make sure that you're not paying non-compliance fees. And we have all kinds of software to make, to help you collect quicker, uh, text to pay, um, things like that, and, and make sure that you're secure. We have OSHA compliance and an audit, $25,000 of protection if, if you ever get audited by OSHA. And then even in cybersecurity, we can be your secondary source of data backup to make sure that you can get it restored if something were to happen to your primary source. Um, we even have email encryption and we have cyber insurance. We, ha we have a policy that covers every one of our clients with incident response. So if there's something happens, we don't want our clients to be exposed. And we just didn't wanna be uh, you know, a, just a basic HIPAA company, HIPAA compliance company. We think it's important, but we wanna be there if something were to happen. And that's why we have a whole incident response services and financial protection through our cyber policy. Um, we love doing trainings like this. We do them all the time. We have a, a portal that gets your all of your employees if they want to participate. And, and we put it all together in a very affordable price. Um, we have more resources on 
Um, I don't know if that's the right link. Let's see. There's a, the, the, yeah, you can, you can click on our website. You can click on this link. Um, we can review your risk assessment with you. And uh, my goal, again, is to give you, so if, if you need it, we have a program that can help you. If you don't need it, you know, I want to just educate you so that you can go on and get things that you might need. Um, you can go on our, you know, the HIPAA webinar link. You can get the risk assessment if you didn't get a chance. You could you could schedule a review of your risk assessment. We will have a senior risk advisor walk you through some of the things that we can help you with if you need it. Um, and you can go get two more hours of training that walks you, uh, your HIPAA officer in more detail of things that you need to understand around the HIPAA security rule and every all the safeguards. And it's a it's an online you know, go at your own pace and get two more credits. Um, if, if you want to be covered today and you don't have any coverage, we'll give you a 30-day free trial. And as long as you start the free trial, you'll be covered. So if you have exposure to OSHA audits, potentially we'll cover you for that. If you need cyber insurance, all you need to do is start the free trial and you'll get the cyber insurance and all your policies and everything will be covered. That it's it, it it's easy to go to the site. I know Jacob's going to send out um, some uh, an email afterwards where that has all this information for you with along with the presentation. Uh, my email is Jeff at PCIHIPAA.com. If you have any questions for me, if you have any critiques, cr criticisms, uh, words of praise, please feel to use that email, and I'm happy to get you the answers you need. We are here to help the industry. We know that this is confusing. We know that you need to spend time treating patients and doing the things that you do great. And this kind of stuff can be uh, burdensome. And that's why we're in business. So I wanna, I wanna thank you for attending. I appreciate your time. I know that you're busy. I hope this was valuable for you. There is a survey that, um, that's, that's in the chat link. Uh, please fill it out. We will give a $25 gift certificate um, for randomly choosing uh, three people that fill those out. Make it four to make it a, an even hundred um, to make it easy. And we want we want you to fill out that survey because it's going to give us feedback and it's going to allow us to spend the time um, in areas that to help us uh, become better and maybe help you if you need it. So uh, only three minutes to spare this time. Uh, but but thank you very much for attending. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I wish you a magical day. Thank you.